we've currently got a constellation of over 8,000 satellites that are flying around in orbit. So they're working together to fill out the whole surface of the Earth, make sure everywhere can have service. So we have these laser links that are connected between the satellites, so each satellite can pass data from one to the other. That is what allows us to have these hundreds of gigabit links between satellites, and that's what allows us to connect every corner of the Earth to high quality, high speed, low latency internet. Of course, there's this interesting um, post on X from the VP of, this is Michael uh -huh. Nichols, he's the VP of Starlink Engineering uh, at SpaceX, says a Starlink mini laser shown in today's video uh, will connect third-party satellites and space stations into the Starlink constellation. The Ooh. mini laser is designed to achieve link speeds of 25 Gbps at a distance of up to 4,000 kilometers and was recently successfully tested in orbit on a satellite launched on Starlink G1020. Wow. That is interesting. That's like the, I guess, the interlaser links they already have, but for yeah. third parties. Uh, what so, do they call it? Plug and Placer? I think that's, that's a great the, name. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They heard it. But I, I guess I'm a little bit surprised seeing this because this looks more like a, a telescope, which is uh, trying to point um, yeah. in a particular direction. Whereas I thought the laser links they had before were using like these internal rotating uh, prisms to be able to to direct mm. it. Now I wonder if this is just more kind of a macro pointing, and then maybe the micro is yeah. somewhere else because that's going to take a while to be able to move around. And the other thing that's a challenge is that when you're doing something like that in space, you're reorienting the entire satellite by doing that. So you need gyros that are kind of countering that at the same time to make sure the rest of your kit is still pointing in the direction that you want. So uh, there's a lot of interesting engineering challenges that I just wanted to point out. Uh, from the market perspective, what's interesting about this, uh, I forget when they announced this, this concept of you know, last year or something where they're gonna be doing these laser terminals. You know, the cost of getting data, data like if you have a satellite today, down from orbit can be up to a million dollars per satellite per year. Um, it's actually a pretty significant cost. It's kind of one of those, right. um, you know, idiot index things that we mm -hmm. that uh, Elon likes to target. Um, so while it's not as massive of a market as the broadband market, which is what they're talking about, it is a massive enabler if you can get into the Starlink network for downlink. They have all these, you know, downlink terminals all over the planet. And effectively, they're now saying, hey, anyone else that's using your, you know, whatever satellite constellation you have, you know, you you actually can get your stuff back to Earth much faster and cheaper. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that that's actually a pretty significant enabler for this, like, you know, 100,000 satellites out on, you know, off planet kind of thing that people are expecting to happen. But so far to date has pretty I mean, much 100,000 um, stalling in the in the constellation. No, just Starling. in general, I think I think right, the right. space industry is expecting like, you know, I think the the, the bull estimate is, you know, 100,000 satellites by 2030 just in general around the globe. And uh, that is, you know, the, the bullish estimate and, you know, maybe 30% of that Starlink. I mean, to date, Starlink is basically all the satellites, not all, but, you know. Yeah, I think it's 8,000. of them. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's about two thirds. That's about 8,000 uh, satellites in the yeah. Starlink constellation. So once that network shell is kind of there, and there'll be yeah. others, Kuiper will be a competitor to this as well, because that's a, a decent, you know, a million dollars per satellite per year. There's a lot of cost to be, you know, cut out of there. Um, yeah. So if you can start to build those shells and have some competitive shells and the existing networks that exist today, there's others that are targeting this. This. Um, yeah, and let's not forget the Chinese. Do you think? Well. Um, do you think SpaceX will uh, open this up to the this feature up to Chinese up to the Chinese constellations, or is that is there going to be national it's, security issues involved? I don't know if the Chinese would want. And this is not Starship. Open this is themselves up to it. Starship yeah, is a yeah. whole different uh, kettle of fish. Yeah. No, I, I think it's it doesn't make sense to me because they're well. I mean, they could you know never say never, but isn't it, China's trying to build their own Starlink? Right, so they would probably be trying to, you know, replicate a similar right. kind of right. Uh, right. thing, and, and, um, not only for bandwidth on Earth, but again, you know, then you you have a network that any any satellite anywhere can connect into and get your get all of your data down much faster. And like part of the problem that exists with that, right, it's, it's costly, but it's the 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 revisits and where you can get down, like and how much bandwidth you can get down. It's something like a 10x or a 100x, or some big number of the amount of data that is generated on satellites that actually gets sent down. So 
there's there's a lot more information and data that we could be pulling down if we had constant communication. So the point being with the, the China question, they're going to have the same problem. This is just like a Earth, the way Earth works, the way geometry is, and the, where you have the ability to downlink your data is fairly limited, and they'll they'll have the same problem. 